it's a great language and it's its intricacies are like you know these great idiosyncrasies it's like getting into a really complicated but cool relationship <laughs> It's the Germany Experience, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. I'm your host, Sean Behrens, and welcome to the show. If you're looking for ways to learn German, I'm an affiliate partner for a great story-based course called German Uncovered. In the course, you read a story in German, and after each chapter, you learn grammar and vocabulary based on that chapter. If you're interested, you can try it out for free. Sign up for the Experience Story-Based German Learning for free course Links are in the show notes. I've also got a link to the German Uncovered course itself. And of course, I am an affiliate partner of German Uncovered. And if you sign up using one of those links, you'll be helping the podcast. Now, it's been a long time coming, but I have finally lined up three great Germans for my Ask a German episode that I've been planning. Basically, I want you, the listener, to ask questions that you've always wanted to ask a German. That's burning a hole in your soul but maybe you were ashamed to ask you were embarrassed you didn't want to uh you know you didn't want to ask it directly to their, to their faces now is your chance you can ask them anything anything and i've got really they're qualified and by qualified i mean they're german i've already had some really good questions that i can ask them but i want more so what i'd like you to do if you have a question that you want to ask a german on this podcast episode that's going to be coming out in about a month's time i'd like you to send me your questions go to thegermanexperience.de forward slash contact. Or you can record a voice message by going to my website and clicking on the little red microphone that pops up in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or just mail me, info at thegermanexperience.de. The questions can cover anything, anything you want to ask a German. This is your chance. This is your chance to ask that question that's been bothering you for so long. All right, on to my guest this week. It's Someone named Elise, and she lives in the United States of America. She's also from the USA, and she's the host of a YouTube channel called Elise Speaks. She speaks several different languages just for fun, just for fun. And German is, of course, one of them. I really enjoyed the videos that I saw when I stumbled across her channel. And then I, I found one that was particularly interesting to me. It's called What I Wish I Knew Before. I learned German. And in this video, I thought she made some really insightful points for people who might be feeling frustrated in the early stages of learning, or maybe they ha if you haven't started learning yet, these things are really, really good to know. So I invited her on the show to talk about her polyglottism, her polyglotness. <laughs> I talked to her about being a polyglot. And of course, we discussed German and we talked through the points that she thinks people should know before they learn German. Here's Elise. From Elise Speaks. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And I must ask right at the beginning, am I saying your name correctly? How do you pronounce? It's Elise. Yeah, I actually appreciate Elise. that a lot because I really like people can get really creative with it. I think I've heard <laughs> about every combination possible now. <laughs> I'm sure. I keep wanting to say Elisa, which I, I don't know if that's a German pronunciation. I think I've gotten that before, also from Brazilians. It's just for oh, some yeah. reason, the silent E in yeah. English is just not a thing in other languages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Elise is, is the Yeah, thing. Elise. Yeah. So the reason I've got you on is I happened, I stumbled across your YouTube channel and you are a polyglot and you've been making a few videos about what it's like to learn multiple languages. And mm -hmm. one of the languages, of course, and the reason you're here today is German. But uh, before we get to that, maybe just tell, give me your background, where you, where you're from and basically, mm -hmm. yeah, tell me about you. Um, okay, so I'm, of course, from the United States. I'm 20 years old, so I've been, yeah, pretty much used to living here by now. I've lived in the South all my life, so different states in the South. But, um, yeah, right now I'm just studying digital media production, so I'm actually in college at the moment. But, yeah, when I'm not cramming or dying because of exams, I'm totally, like, into languages and I think I've been pretty active, like in the language community, maybe in the past year or so, or maybe year and a half now. And it's something that I didn't even know existed, you know, but it's so cool to see that there's so many people that are interested in it as well. Yeah, there, there really is. And your YouTube channel has grown quite a lot. 
Yeah, it's been freaking me out. Like, uh, I think in March I had maybe a thousand, and now it's up to like thirty three thousand. So in March, yeah, you had a yeah. thousand to. So you went from a thousand to thirty three thousand in the space of what seven seven months, eight months? Pretty much, yeah. I think it was a couple of different videos that really made that happen, and they were my German videos because those are those are the ones that have like two hundred to like three hundred. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, like views. <laughs> For some reason, I think it's because of a lack of resources, but everybody is suddenly really into German, which is cool. It, it is it is cool. It, it is cool. It's, but it's something I've noticed uh, recently as well. It's just exploded. It exploded. There's uh, YouTubers who are talking about life in Germany, people talking about German, learn German channels. Yeah. It seems there's a lot of... What do, you, what do you think the reason for that is? Do you have a theory? I'm really... I don't know. I think it. I'm really happy for it, whatever the reason is, because I feel like for so long... Everyone's just been like, oh, German, like, who cares? They just sound really angry, Schnitzel and all that. So it's like, I think people are starting to give it the same kind of, I guess, courtesy as other languages. Because yeah. it's really not an ugly language. It's awesome. No, it's not. It's a language. So... Yeah, I think like you, I think like you say to the uninitiated ear, it does sound kind of aggressive and harsh because there's a lot of maybe harsh sounds, I guess. But once you really start learning it and learning the the, the flow of the language and and the, how the words fit together and how the sentences are built, mm -hmm. you realize, wow, this is a, a really really beautiful language. Yeah, yeah, I've been I've really been meaning to get back into it recently because yeah. I think learning German like versus other languages, it's such like a commitment, you know, because <laughs> I, I always say like it's not something that you can just like leave you know it's, it's it takes like re intense prolonged contact to really build like an understanding yeah and you would say it's more so with german than other languages in your experience i think so i think it's mm, aside from like the little chinese that i know i think it's the most different language that i've studied because, you know, Spanish and French and Portuguese are all, like, pretty similar to English in terms of structure and grammar. But German's just, like, it was, like, a whole other animal to tackle. Yeah, which is strange because they're both Germanic languages. So you would expect there to right. be more similarities. Exactly. And I always, I talk, I, I'm also a teacher and I talk to my students about this all the time, that really the only, like, straws that we can grasp at as English speakers are the vocabulary and even yeah. those are not always the same it's like sister <laughs> schwester so there's like still a little bit of a, you know a change yeah yeah, yeah. so you're better so you that that's how you got you so you're in college and you're mm -hmm. but you're 20 years old you said and how many languages do you speak at this point yeah that's funny i always say speak and sign because there's a sign language in there as well right. but um so of course english native then in order of fluency i guess spanish french portuguese German, uh, American Sign Language, and Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite, that is quite a broad range of languages. Yeah. And, and you would say you're fluent in those languages? Um, absolutely not. I think they all have different, <laughs> I'm not even going to front, like they have totally different understandings, you know, yeah. but I feel, I feel comfortable in all of them except for Chinese, I think, because I started that one just this year. Okay. So what do you think uh, has been the reason behind your fascination with languages? Yeah, I always get kind of stumped when people give me this question. I think it's just, it's been a huge kind of escape, you know, because it's never been something that I want to do professionally. And for that reason, I always come back to it. You know, a lot of people like friends that I have in the language community, they're translators and interpreters and they study linguistics and stuff. But for me, it's always just been like, my one true love or something not to be okay crazy. you don't want to you don't want to ruin it by making it your professional career <laughs> yeah it's not it's not and also i have other interests you know and I, yeah. I always find a way to combine languages with that you know so because like doing media production i got a really good experience of like editing software and all that by having my language channel so i feel like you know it's always just been I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It's just something that I really love and I don't want to make it something that I have to do for money. <laughs> yeah. So what what would you say your proficiency in German is? Um, I think the last time, I've never taken an official test, but the last time I took like a mock test, it was at B2. So that I think is a little bit ambitious. I'm not sure. Maybe it was just because it was a written test instead of like a spoken full comprehension test, you know, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say somewhere between B1 and B2. So Okay. 
let's focus on your German now, because obviously this is the German Experience podcast. So <laughs> I'm interested in, in your path to learning German. When did you start and what was the reason specifically for learning, for, for choosing German? Um, I was about 15. It was in high school because my high school, they offered Spanish, French, German, and Latin. And so I already spoke Spanish. So when I got to high school, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? So I started to take French because that was basically just like Spanish's cousin. But then after a year of that, I realized that just like studying languages came really easily to me because I already had experience. So I was like, oh, well, let's just add another one on to it, you know, and it was also funny because the Spanish, I mean, sorry, the, the French and German classrooms were right next to each other. So, you know, I would just walk over from fourth period to fifth period, like <laughs> and German. So, yeah, okay. I think I just realized that I have a knack for it. And I was like, why not? Why not? I wish why I had not? Some, some emotional backstory, like, oh, my long lost cousin. <laughs> was yeah. Where's the drama, Elise? Where's the drama? <laughs> so about a month ago so you you put up put up videos every now and then uh, about german amongst uh, amongst the other languages i've seen you do some videos about learning i think spanish and then some general tips for learning languages yeah um, spanish and german are like my two most i guess discussed languages on the channel yeah and then about a month ago, you put out a video called What I Wish I Knew Before Learning German. I thought this might be a good thing to talk about on the podcast as well, because you have, you've got this experience with learning German. You also have a lot of experience learning languages and you, 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 know some, you have some insights and stuff. So yeah. I just want to talk through, if you don't mind, through some of the points that you made in that video, because I thought it was very cool. And the first point that you made was sentence inversion. So that was, mm-hmm. maybe you want to explain what you mean, like what, what would it, what, what about sentence inversion do you wish you knew and how would it have helped you? Yeah, I think it was just, it was just a completely new concept. And I'm not even sure if that's the correct term for it, because like, like I mentioned, I never studied linguistics, but it just, you know, it means like when, if you have certain trigger words that make the sentence go backwards, like then, or if you have like a time phrase, like inventa or something like that. So it, it's it's weird because sometimes the trigger word is so small that you don't even realize that it happens. Yeah. You're like, why is the sentence backwards? <laughs> so <laughs> yes. it's, it just totally caught me off guard when I started learning because, you know, they never, they never really prepare you for that. No. No, and I think the one of the biggest problems for for I, I think it was a good point that you brought up in that video because one it's one of the biggest problems in understanding as well. So you do these courses and you get to a certain level of German and you you're like okay I, I'm doing pretty well, but then when you actually in a real life environment with Germans speaking German to them, mm-hmm. they do that they do that all the time. They 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 structure a sentence in that you're listening. And halfway through the sentence, you're still going, where is this going? Where, know, what is, what is happening? It off, like the verb comes at the end. You're like, oh, got it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the other thing about inversion. Because like sometimes you don't connect the main idea of the sentence until the end because, you know, the main verb will come at the end and you're just like, oh. And the problem is when you're when you're speaking a new language is that you or you you're naturally trying to build up the meaning as you're going along. So if someone is saying a sentence to you, you're already making certain assumptions about that sentence based on what he, mm-hmm. what you've heard. And then when you get to the end, sometimes it's you, you've led yourself completely astray. So I think it was such a good yeah. bit of advice to say that you should know when you're learning, you're going to learn this as it is here in the book, and uh, you're going to learn this sentence structure. But in reality, mm-hmm. there's this other stuff that's going to be happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's a great feature. I'm not saying like, oh, this sucks. Why do they do this in this language? It's just because it's like a great way to emphasize, Yeah. you know, I think, I think that's kind of the point of inversion is to emphasize or really call attention to something. So exactly, you know, yeah. it's cool. I'm, I'm happy yeah. that I actually understand it now. <laughs> just have to remember to put it into practice when I'm actually talking. It's a hard part of yeah. The other thing that you mentioned was uh, grammar and you, so advice that is often passed around is that, and I've heard it a lot as well. And I think I might've given this advice as well, is that you shouldn't mm-hmm. necessarily worry too much about grammar. You should get yourself up and running, but you see it slightly different about grammar. Yeah. I think it's just because um, I think everybody in the language community and just even the average person knows that German has very intricate grammar that is like yeah. very interwoven into like almost every word, you know, because it's going to be a different sentence 
if you're saying like uh, I have a book or versus like the, the the red book is on the table, you know. So in the adjectives, the cases are reflected like in the verbs and everything. So it's like you kind of have to come to terms with like okay, if I don't want to if I don't want to set up myself for like not failure, but it might take you a long time to yeah. grasp something later if you don't do some work up front and. I think I'm I'm just like a grammar lover, so I'm cool with it. But <laughs> most people, they get really scared. It's like, you know, a big commitment. Yeah, I I used to say, don't worry about the grammar. And I think I think um, I, I I think your point is extremely valid. So my opinion has changed somewhat. I think in some ways you shouldn't worry about having good grammar when you're speaking. You should just speak the language that you're learning. But what you're saying is that when you're you should you should be learning the grammatical structures and the reasons. And and exactly like you said. I find when I uh, when I know the reason behind something, it's easier to remember it because mm-hmm. then I know okay that's working like that because of this r- rule, and then uh, I can I can I can remember yeah. it easier. Yeah, and also the thing is that like with grammar, you also when you're listening, you hear like native speakers saying the correct thing. So after a while, I feel like it just absorbs into you anyway. And if that's if that's already in tandem with maybe like just a little bit of like in book or website grammar study every week. Yeah. It's like, you don't even have to do all the work if you're exposed to the language already. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think you can pick up a lot of it um, just organically through listening to other mm-hmm. Germans being put into situations where you have to, where, where you have to speak the language. Uh, it's obviously not an option for people like you living in the United States of America, <laughs> where there might not be a lot of German speakers yeah. around. So, so it's more active, but I do think that my, my biggest mistake with German was not learning the grammar in the beginning because mm. now I have a lot of bad habits in my German which are difficult yeah. to get out and it's a lot of it's because I didn't focus on the grammar from an early enough phase so yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's hard though because when you're just learning a language you're not sure what things are important so that's kind of what I was trying to do with the video was say like hey maybe you're, you're already learning German or maybe you want to like this is what you should look out for because I feel like you know, people will say grammar is hard, but they never go into detail about it and say, like, yeah. you don't have to lose hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. You know. Yeah. And then uh, one of the other points that you mentioned in that video was the, that a lot of the difficulties to learning German are similar to difficulties that people learning English have. So you, you were saying like prepositions. Yeah. Prepositions are really hard for people learning German. But it's also, it's the same kind of difficulties that pe- German people or other languages might have when they're learning English. Yeah. So they're, they're uh, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling to learn exactly when is it auf dem Tisch an den, an den yeah. Wand or... Yeah, 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 yeah. Because if someone asked me to translate the word auf to English, I would have no answer because there's like... No. It, it It depends on the context completely. So just translating it, it's like, is not enough. Like you really have to get a feel for the prepositions. And that also comes in and combines with the cases you know so it's it's really just like you can't just do it on a linear level like okay this means this this means this it's very contextual but um yeah yeah. and I think in English like um I teach English so people for example they always have problems with in and on that's like maybe the most famous one or to and at and things like that so I think prepositions are really kind of nuanced in German as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was a good point as well. And then yeah. one, one of my favorite discussions, and I think you got some uh, comments in your comment section about this, but you were talking about anglicisms, oh, sorry, not anglicisms, yeah. and anglicisms yeah. uh, that German uses. Uh, yeah. And it, it was it was also something that astounded me when I first got to Germany was how many English words They've adopt, adopted some officially in the in the dictionary and some that they just pull into their language. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's funny because we're two native English speakers talking about this. So I feel like, uh, you know, really the only people that get to have this conversation when in any language are like the native speakers of that language and the, I guess, the English speakers who have had their words taken. So it's just like, <laughs> it's kind of weird when you come into a different language and you're like stressing about finding the the right way to say it. And they're like, Oh no, that's just that's sale. Like you know, just we just use the English. It's word. a sale, yeah. yeah. 
instead of for calf or uh, or I think the example that you gave was um, uh, chilling. What's, what was the, what yeah, was the example you gave? Yeah, uh, ambition, chilling or something. Yeah, chilling. And that's hilarious to me as well, how they not just take the word, but they also apply German grammatical uh, rules to it. <laughs> so they were like, hast du das gecheckt? Have you, have yeah, you checked yeah, that yeah, or yeah. did you see that? I don't think that's so cool. I really like that though, because you know, they do that in other languages too. So it's like, it's cool because they're making it their own and they're yeah. kind of, you know, reinforcing that, I guess, German identity back into it. Because it wouldn't make sense to just put an English verb in there, you know? No. But I don't know, I'm fine with Anglicisms when they're accurately used, you know? Because, yeah. like, uh, I've, I've heard, I've, like, in my German podcast that I listened to, Easy German, they did an episode about this and they said that mostly it's like the, the younger generation that does that. Yeah. So like they've had more exposure to technology, like modern music and stuff. And when they use those words with their parents, their parents are like, that's how school designed. They look at that, you know, repeat it because it's just not the way that they grew up. So yeah. I think that's also yeah. a part of it. But I'm cool. With them, so I just don't, I'm wary of using them myself sometimes. I am as well. And also because I don't know what the rules around it are. So, uh, uh, for example, I just sometimes what I do is if I don't remember the German word, I will pull in an English word. And I've I've also mm -hmm. if, if it's in past tense or something, then I also do decline it in a specific way, like yeah. as if it was a German word. But the thing is, then often they just stare at me because they're, the Germans have maybe never heard that English word. Or they don't know like, what the hell I've just what said. What are you doing? The yeah. good thing though is a lot of, like I said also in the video, a lot of German people speak very good English. So... I mean, you could get away with that, maybe. You know, yeah. It's good to have a yeah. security blanket there above, you know, all else. Yeah, exactly. And then along the same lines, is they name TV shows after with English words. So it's a German TV show, but they oh, name yeah. it with an English title. So Dark just came out recently. It's an English word, but it's. Yeah, it's, that's true. It, yeah, yeah. Dark's been blowing <laughs> up, and I think just to kind of go off the rails a little bit, it's like it's crazy because it's a. a series not in english that has had so much international success like yeah. i see people raving about it like in all different countries on twitter so i think that's really cool yeah it, it, it's become a bit of a phenomenon yeah yeah i i haven't gotten even through the first episode yet like i'm so late yeah. i feel like on the yeah. train but <laughs> yeah, i don't know yeah it is it is tricky for non-native german speakers if you're not going to watch it with some kind of subtitles because um it's very complicated. The, the plot is yeah. extremely complex. Yeah, sure. In fact, I even had to make notes while I was watching it, which is the first oh. time that I've ever watched a TV show making notes. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of weird when you watch stuff in a second language because it's like, all right, this is technically not leisure. This is like yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then last, the last point, or one of the one of the last points that you made in that video was uh, something we've already touched on now. You, you just said something you think German learners should know from an early stage is that German is beautiful. And we covered that at the top of the show. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I think that it's like, you know, we've had our fun, you know, with all the memes and those like videos in the past that went viral, but it's like kind of gets old after a while. And also, you know, just because people kind of, they don't always make fun of me because I know German because they, they always like associate it with like Germany's past and they use that to kind of like, I guess, make the language seem like some beast or like, oh, it's yeah. evil, but it's like, you know. I, I, who cares? Like, that's what I have to say. Who cares? It's a great language. And it's its intricacies are like, you know, these great idiosyncrasies. It's like yeah. getting into a really complicated but cool relationship. <laughs> um, how how do you keep up your German living over there? We said the USA is not so easy. Yeah, yeah. That was also one of my points in the video. It's like you kind of have to put in so much effort to keep up with it. Um, I think... I'm much more like a speaking and listening person than reading and writing. Um, so I really only do that when I have to, but I love to just take italki lessons. I think like just, just personal conversation and listening to people. I feel like that's just in general, not even just with German that really helps yeah. to just feel it and, you know, adopt its nuances and everything. Yeah. But yeah, I also love to listen to music and podcasts and, um, like reading the transcript of those podcasts. So, you know, I do incorporate like some type of visual elements, but yeah. Okay. I feel like I really need to get more into TV and movies though. Cause I feel like that's when you truly start to feel, I guess just like the strongest connection. Cause when you watch stuff like content in that language, you also get, you know, more feel for the culture and like how people are or 
yeah, in general. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is you, I've seen in some of your videos, you've, you've recommended some, some books that you read and, and, uh, some websites that you find useful. What resources and tips uh, do you have for people who are learning German? Um, yeah, let's think, let's think. I plug this one book every single time. Like, I make a video about German. I'm like, Bye. Like, are they sponsoring you? No, I don't even know. They should be. <laughs> this is this one book. It's just called German Grammar Drills. It's by Ed Swick. I think it's okay. the eighth edition. It's just an orange book, and it's very simple. It's just like, okay, here's the lesson. Write some sentences. Go in the book and check them. So it's like, I don't know. It's like, I feel like drills are so useful for grammar just because they just kind of hammer it into your head, which I need sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I love that book. That's always my like number one, write or die. Uh, of course, also there's, there's a lot of different websites. What I like most is, gosh, why is that escaping my head right now? Lingolia. That's it. That's it. Okay. And they have like resources for French and I think Spanish, English, German, Russian. It's like just a handful of languages, but Lingolia, they do also really good um, like grammar explanations that I go to for German. But um, I don't know. I think for like traditional resources, also Easy German, they do a YouTube channel and they have a podcast with transcripts if you subscribe to their Patreon. And I feel like those three for me are like a really good combination on top of my lessons, you know, to actually exercise what I learn. Right. So you're still doing German lessons, though, like in a classroom. Um, it's. Uh, do you know what Italki is? Uh, no. Oh, interesting. I feel like that's like the universal. But um, yeah. So it's basically just like a website where you take personal one-on-one -on -one, like video lessons. Okay. So it's usually pretty cheap. I think it averages at like ten or twelve bucks an hour. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think I always I use those lessons maybe like once a week or once every two weeks to just exercise what I'm doing and learning on yeah. my own. And yeah, but I think overall I'm like a very traditional kind of learner. So I, I don't really, you know, like I said, I'm not good with TV shows or like apps mm. or stuff. I just really like listening to people talk and learning stuff and then repeating it and like, you know, books and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a good approach as well. It helps with the accent. I think a lot of Germans struggle with the pronunciation for a long time. But if you if you've got a more of approach of listening and learning through that that approach, I think it it helps with pronunciation. Absolutely, yeah, I yeah. agree. I just looked up Italki, and I'm probably literally the only person on the planet that doesn't heard about this. I think is it like they've really expanded their marketing in the past couple yeah. of years, and like I all just my haven't. ads now are for them. And so, also, I'm a teacher there. So I teach English, so it's like, okay. I think it's really, really solidified. People love that. Just because it, it's basically just a platform. It's like you just find people to talk to. That's very cool. Uh, I will put links to the books that you recommended and to italki for the two other people in the world that don't know about italki. <laughs> However, now that I've Googled it, I'm now going to get ads in my Facebook feeds and everywhere for it. So yeah, I'm going to hear a lot about it. They've done really good marketing <laughs> the past year or so. Good on you, italki, except for not reaching Sean. It's like the yeah. only person you have. Yeah, good play. job, Italki. You <laughs> missed this guy. So you said you teach English. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've got a question for you for, because a lot of my listeners will be non-native English speakers who are mm -hmm. either thinking of moving to Germany or are here. So that means that they have actually got a, a native language that they speak and then they're learning. They've probably learned English for a longer period of time, probably mm -hmm. from school, usually and then they've come here and they've started learning German. So what they're effectively doing is they're at different levels, but they're learning two second languages. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice? Because you're doing that all the time. You're learning like, I don't know how many, eight, nine hundred different eight languages. At the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but you've got these second languages going on. How do you approach that? Is it, is it a problem for you d learning more than one second language at the, at the same time? And what mm -hmm. tips do you have for people? I think I don't do that very often. Just be, like I think I have in the past, of course, but this year is what's fresh in my mind. So I've been taking kind of breaks. But from what I do remember, it's you know if you're learning two languages at the same time, basically I think the only advice that you really need is you know don't start them both from zero at the same time because right you know especially with like languages that are kind of similar like English and German, it's like you might start to confuse them or you know, you really start to understand something in one language and you come to the other one and you're like, oh, this is not the same or something. 
you know, so I think that's really the only place where people continually go wrong is, you know, trying to learn them both from zero at the same time. Because, you know, when I when I study two languages at the same time, it's always like I'm doing maintenance on my Spanish, which is already very advanced. And then I'm doing some like less advanced stuff in German. And then right. on top of that, they're completely different. So it helps. But yeah. Because that, that was my other question is how do you keep them up? But I quite like, I like that uh, analogy of doing maintenance on the one language. So it's a different approach almost. Yeah. You're just trying to keep the one up while you're learning yeah. the fundamentals of another. And, and something else that I've done before is just like switch it out every week. Or like, I don't know if you have just like time blocking it. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm doing this for two weeks and I'm doing this for two weeks. Or, you know, I do this in the morning or I do this in the night. Like it can be in any type of scale, you know, it just depends on right. I, I tend to do it by week just because I want some kind of stability or to at least have my brain in the same language for at least 24 hours. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that makes but, sense. <laughs> yeah, time blocking, I feel like, is also really popular. Mm -hmm. what, when, one of the videos, I, th I can't remember which one, I think it might have been your tips and resources video. Mm -hmm. uh, you had something called a language board. Yeah, that's cool. So tell me how that works. Yeah, I don't have it anymore because it's currently serving as a to-do list. Um, but... <laughs> you know, priorities when you go back. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I basically, I did uh, like smaller goals on that language board. So it's like, I already know when people say like, I want to be C1 in German or something. It's like, okay, but like, what are you going to do? Like, what, what are you, what are you going to do day by day? And I think yeah. I said in that video that it's just like the bricks of a house. You know, you can look at pictures all day of like the house that you want, but if you don't, go get some, I don't know, wood and like you need to hook up the gas and get everything ready. So it's like all these different parts coming together. And I think that's yeah. where people, they, they get frustrated because they want their long-term goal without, you know, putting in just a little bit every day. So right. you know, I might write like, okay, do your Quizlet flashcards, analyze a song, do a song translation and, you know, listen to a podcast just passively, like while you wash the dish dishes or something. So it's, yeah. you know, I try to exercise different skills, like listening or writing or just drills, like grammar practice or something to kind of just keep my brain active and like really productive instead of focusing on long term. Mm -hmm. Now, with your with your German language learning, have you had a chance to come over to Germany and use it? Yes, it was actually a very short time. It was uh, last December. I came right the day before New Year. So I got right thrown into like, you know, German drinking culture and all that. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was funny, but it was super cool. It was just a week that I was there. I was in Cologne. And uh, yeah, it was a super cool experience, I think, because um, I don't think I've ever talked about this on my channel very much, but like the the day after New Year's when I was just walking around town looking for like some shop to be open to find shampoo. This woman came up to me and she was like, you know, in German, of course, she's like, can I, can I help you find something? You look a little lost. And I told her, I'm trying to look for some shampoo, you know, and she like invited me to her house, gave me her shampoo and then what? took me to breakfast with her neighbors. So it was like the biggest welcome that I didn't expect at all. Wow. So they, that goes to anyone who says that the believes buys into the stereotype that Germans are unfriendly. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. This woman gave you shampoo and invited you into her home. Yeah, and I was like, I just had my head and shoulders, and I was like, oh, <laughs> man, this is so nice. What is happening? And I will admit, like, I was one of the people that, it, at, to some degree, bought into that stereotype just because, you know, I'd never really met one, you know, yeah. like an actual person that hadn't been living in the United States before. Right. You know, so it was just very cool. And she actually, she invited me over twice. I went to her house and made spring rolls with her daughter. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, that, that is a pretty speed that I would say speed friendship in Germany. Yeah, that is, yeah. that is fast, but cool. it, it is, it is a stereotype and it's a stereotype for a reason. I think that the difficulty a lot of people have is developing real uh, deep connections with people. And what mm. happens, what happened to you, um, yeah, that's not, that's, I would say that's not the norm because usually the Germans take a while to invite you into their home. Yeah. But I've also come across many Germans who are exactly like that, who, yeah. who will invite you in straight away. I think so. it was because, you know, I'm, I'm young and obviously she was a mom. So she's like, yeah. oh, you know, let me be right. nice to this girl. Yeah. 
Um, so what what else? How else was your was your week in Germany? Did, how was it for you, having learned the language? You obviously developed some kind of affinity for the for the country, even though you're living far away. What was it like seeing Germany? Did it live up to your expectations? Or yeah, absolutely. I wish that I had been there for more time to you know just like take a train, go to a different city or something. But usually, when I go to a country for the first time, I like to just stay in one place and kind mm. of feel for it, you know. I'm not really like a day trip, let's be crazy kind of traveler. But um, I really, I think it did live up to my expectations just because it's like, I already knew, for example, that um, like they have a lot of Turkish residents and like Turkish immigrants. So that was super cool because I got to actually see and hear that, like walking down the street. I felt like, you know, it has that same like element of multiculturality. Is that sure. a word? I don't know. Um, that we have in the United States. So it's like, in that way, I felt at home because it's, you know, I heard Turkish on the street all the time. And yeah. also, yeah, it's like I've seen, I had seen all the pictures of Cologne. So it was beautiful to actually see it and hear it. Even in like the, the, the gas station or like, you know, the convenience stores, they're like, oh, you're a foreigner. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's cool to talk to strangers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, Cologne is one of my favorite cities as well. It is it, the the architecture is obviously beautiful, and that beautiful church that they have there. So it's yeah. incredible. Super, super. Yeah. I, yeah, there was like some construction or scaffolding going on while I was there, so I didn't get like the perfect, you know, Instagram picture, but still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to Neuschwanstein Castle, which is down in Bavaria. I don't know if you know, it's a it's a famous cool. castle in in Germany, and I was there. And it was completely scaffolded up. So all my pictures have like this thing. So I, I pretty much download pictures from the internet and send it to people. <laughs> scaffolding is like the enemy of, I guess, yeah. modern traveling. <laughs> yeah. It's like the one t the time I went to London and I wanted to see, obviously, Big Ben, the, the tower. And I, it was all scaffolded up. And I was like, wow, yeah. that's and amazing. And on top of that, I feel like a lot of people say London's always rainy. So it's like, oh, man, you really yeah. got to be there just at the right time. Really yeah, do. The full experience, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Um, any plans to come back to Germany in the future? Absolutely. You know, it's uh, like mentioning, bringing up my major, I work in digital media production, which it's not such like a, I, I guess, country oriented profession or line of work, you know, because like people mm. all over the world need videos made. They want to do films and documentaries. So I feel like it's something that I can do in any country. Yeah. And I want to, you know, live in a lot of different places than the United States. Like, you know, Mexico, Germany, maybe even like some Northern European countries at some point, like Iceland. But yeah, I definitely plan to come back. Like I want to, I've always, it's been like a dream of mine to work in a lot of different countries and, you know, get to know the market in all different kinds of places. Yeah. Well, uh, Elise, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and, and having this chat. Yeah, yeah it's super yeah. fun. I think I really like need a lot more, I guess, German community. <laughs> Because a lot of people are friends that I know, they study it like casually, right. you know, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But hats off to you for being living there for so long and completely immersed and now making this experience a little bit easier for other people. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that surprised me is the people, I've gotten good feedback from the, from the podcast because people say it's good to hear that their experiences are not, you know, my guests have the same experiences they do. So yeah. it, it makes them feel better about the whole thing and makes things a lot easier. Um, yeah. And of course I, I went through the same things now I, I've been here for 13 years. So oh, gosh, wow. it, it, it's, it's, I'm at a weird phase where I'm not adjusting. I mean, I'm, I guess I'll always be adjusting in some ways, but I'm not adjusting anymore like I was in the beginning, but I also don't have a, a concrete identity. I no longer identify as being a South African. I have mm. a German passport now, but I also don't see myself as a German. So it's like, yeah. Very interesting. Got a little identity crisis. There. Yeah. Welcome to my life. A good identity crisis, though. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. <laughs> um, Elise, where can people find you? Obviously, you've got the YouTube channel, Elise Speaks. Yeah, basically just anywhere except Twitter. That's Elise De Vega, but you can just find, mm. just Google Elise Speaks and you'll find me somewhere. Okay, I will, I will link to all those places. On the show awesome. notes. All right. Well, it's truly been a pleasure talking to you. Really yeah. nice. Likewise. Thank you so much. All right, and don't forget you can find Elise on YouTube and Instagram. All of the links are in the show notes. Show notes. And what's interesting to me is uh, Dark, the TV show Dark, has come up a few times on this podcast in the past. And I can tell you it's coming up in my discussion with the guys from Can You German next week as well. So it seems like 
it seems like I'm going to have to do an episode on Dark very, very soon, which I will do very happily. I love the show a lot, a lot. It's It was very, very much hyped up and I finally finished it and I can say that it is it is. It lives up to the hype. It is a very well written TV show. So maybe I'll do a dark episode at some point in the near future. All right. Thank you for listening. Music as always. Theme song by my band, Ten Cent Janes. Additional music by Ryan Anderson. Until the end. This is the end. I'll speak to you next week. Auf Wiederhören. <laughs>